What's this? A map of England. I'm glad you said that. What's wrong with the description? So, what do you mean by the UK? England and Scotland and Wales. Okay, so there's England. Yep, there's Ireland. There's Scotland. There's Wales. Also Northern Ireland. Any other names for it? Yeah, Great Britain, because Ireland is a separate country, isn't it, as we know so well. Um, and, uh, and so consequently, this is not the map, this is not the UK, yep, this is, um, that bit of it, the island of Ireland is the UK, but this is IRA, the Republic of Ireland, yeah, so it's not England, it's not the UK, it's not Great Britain, it's Great Britain and Ireland, perhaps. Do you know what the, um, the textbooks in Ireland call it? The geographic textbooks in Ireland call it. No, they don't like British Isles because, yeah, obviously that has some connotations with the imperial past. They call it the North Atlantic Archipelago. Yeah, you haven't heard that, have you? The North Atlantic Archipelago. An archipelago is a group of islands and it's in the North Atlantic, so that's a very accurate description. My point, my point is um, that... There are always more than one name. Some are more correct than others. Some are more colloquial. It's easy, isn't it, to drop into England. But there's more or less scientific names for things. And anatomy is similar. And I'm going to be using this geographic map sort of motif or analogy across these slides today. Because I have the feeling that you know more about maps and the world than you do human anatomy. I may be wrong. It's just that every time you turn the telly on, you get a weather map, don't you? And you're used to seeing things like this. So maybe that analogy will work and will help you to bring in the anatomical concepts. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Regions. Someone shouted at the back. What was it? Counties. Counties. Yeah. So these are regions of. And someone else said something else about which part of the United Kingdom is this? England. Yeah. You're not fooled by this bit over here. Yeah. Quite a lot of people think this is Northern Ireland, but in fact it's just London that's been relocated over there and blown up into a bigger scale. Yeah, so well done. You've not been falling for that trick. So we've not got Scotland, we've not got Wales, and we've got no, no Northern Ireland. We've just got London where Northern Ireland should be. So these are, are um, counties or unitary authorities, because London, of course, has got lots of authorities in it. And we live in it. Um, several of us live in unity authorities like Middlesbrough, which isn't a county as such. Um, and it's... The reason I've got this map up here is because what we're saying is that you can subdivide something for your own purposes. So this is about recycling rates. So this is unitary authorities and counties and how well they do in terms of recycling. And that's what this diagram suggests. The other important point to note on this diagram is the fact that London is out of place and out of scale. You've got to be very careful when you're looking at anatomy... Um, when you're trying to learn your anatomy because a lot of the textbooks will do this sort of thing which will really mess with your brain and make it difficult for you to understand where things should be where things are related to and we'll come on to that concept in a bit okay so the borders that make up these counties and then within the counties there are subdivisions of counties called wards yeah where councillors are elected, you know, so a county has several councillors and those councillors are elected to each ward. I've blown up a spot here that comes from down here somewhere. Anyone know this area of England? Okay, yeah, so did I. I got married in this area of England. So look at this, these lines that make up these wards. What, um, what might you find if you went down 
you know, like um, on Google Maps, you can drop the little man, can't you, and have a look around. What might we see if we drop the little man on this line here? And what might we see if we drop the little man on this line here? What's the difference between this line and this line, do you think? I can't tell you exactly, but I'm just hypothesising. Do you think there'd be any difference? Different area, but why is what's what's why is that line? What makes this line different to this line? Yeah, it's straight. So, when you see a straight line like this on a county border or an award border, what might you find there when you go? A road. Yep. Yeah. What else? Might be a signifying an edge. Sorry. A lake or water, or maybe a stream or a, a river. You're not likely to see a road or a stream on this border here, are you? Because of its the way it is. A stream doesn't flow like that, does it? And a road tends not to be built like that, although there are a few roads like that. So what do you think might you might end up why why what might you see there when you go there? <coughs> My feeling is you won't see anything. Because what this is, is a political boundary, right? This is a political boundary where one farmer wanted to be in one ward back in the day and owned a certain amount of land, and another farmer in another <coughs> wanted to be in another ward and owned a certain amount of land, and they just literally drew the ward boundary along the boundary of the land. Do you think that happens, doesn't it? So this is what I would call a political boundary, and this is a physical boundary. So when you go and look at these straight lines, you'll see something physical there that makes an obvious change. Have you heard of these people who have one side of the road, the bins are collected on a Wednesday because they're in a particular borough, and another side of the road they're collected on a Thursday because they're in a different borough, and you pay different council taxes. Yeah, it's one of those sort of political boundaries. And in anatomy, we have those as well. So we have scenarios where you can talk about an area, and then it changes to another area, so the proper name for something changes but when you actually look in the body, there's nothing there to see. There's no change. There's just a political boundary. Whereas other times, there's a physical boundary. And you can say, once you get beyond this muscle, then it becomes X. So we have both physical and political boundaries. That's where that comes from there. Okay, what are we looking at now? Sorry? Sorry? Well, I'm just thinking that's now not quite the same, is it? So what what have we got added? <coughs> Wales. We're adding Wales. Okay, so Wales has been added to England. So now we're looking at England and Wales, okay? Whereas the previous map was just England. But where the others were counties, are these counties? They're much bigger than counties, aren't they? Because that's Norfolk and Suffolk. Yeah? So these are something different. I don't really know what they are. Well, they're actually cancer networks. Now, how or who decided that this was the size or the boundary of a particular cancer network? It would have been something to do with some sort of NHS plan at some point. And, um, and these are organised cancer networks. And so all those in that particular area have some sort of structure and they report to a certain group of people who lead that cancer network. Yeah. So we're in that one there, N07, I guess. Or we might not be. We're sort of on the boundary of N13 and N07, really, aren't we? Well, so basically, no, no, we're not. We're in N07. That's Hull. N07, we're up here. Yeah, and N036 is, uh, is Northumbria. And it goes all the way across the country. So that crosses the Pennines, which is unusual in county boundaries. So count cancer networks. This is The slide here is about different people deciding for different purposes to group the same things differently. Yep. And so you'll end up with that in anatomy as well. Another one. Here we go. So uh, what are we looking at here? It says there, age standardized death rates. Um, the redder it is, then the higher the death rate, and the whiter it is, the lower the death rate. 
And these are not counties, these are what the old health authorities, so these are smaller than counties. Um, and this is where we are here, in the red bit. <laughs> Well, it's the data. It's the data. <laughs> They're not making it look that way. That is actually recorded data, yeah? So there's 188 to 219 deaths per 100,000 in the red bits and only 78 to 122 in the white bits, okay? So <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that gives rise to this idea of the north-south divide and the fact that it's, um, you know, there's um, lots of deprivation in the north, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. One of the downsides um, is that research has shown that you tend to adopt the health statistics of the area you move to. So um, I don't know any of you have moved into the from the white areas to the red areas. Um, I, I I started life here in a white area just there, so I'm not doing so well. Another theory is that there's a lot of genetics around these deaths, and these are deaths for cardiovascular disease. These are cardiovascular disease deaths. Um, and another theory is that if there's genetics. So when you look in Europe to look at where Europe sits with this, the countries that have all the red areas in Europe are Scandinavian countries. Okay? And so the idea is that the Vikings came from Scandinavia, yeah, and they raped and pillaged the northeast and the, the north of England, and they actually had the Dane law. So for large parts of um, the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, um, we had Dane law. So this whole area of England was actually ruled by the Vikings. That's why Jorvik Centre in York, yeah? Um, and so they've left their genes behind. Yeah. That's another theory. Okay, I've got a theory. They did a census, right? And they asked... Um, 2001 census, they asked people what religion they were, and uh, they broke it down into wards, and this is the sort of results, and it shows quite interesting reading. There were 390,000 Jedi reported in the census in 2001, okay? And the counties that had the least Jedi were Easington, Sedgefield, Weir Valley, and Hartlepool, South Tyneside. These were all in the northeast of England. And they all had less than 1% Jedi, yeah? Whereas the councils, the counties in the south of England, the Cambridge, Wandsworth, Oxford and Brighton and Hove, they had 2.6% Jedi. So it's clear to me that the force is stronger in the south, <laughs> which is why we have the problem that we have. Okay, so point one. The human body can be divided and named differently depending on the profession doing the observing. So if you're interested in recycling rates, then you divide the country differently to if you're interested in age-standardized death rates to if you're interested in cancer. Yeah? And the purpose for why you're looking changes the observation. Now, we're medical imaging. We're looking at the body from a medical imaging point of view. So there is such a thing as radiographic anatomy. Okay? That's different to an another anatomy, which is for another purpose. So you'll have to learn basic anatomy, but also there'll be this radiographic anatomy that's got a slight <coughs> different focus. Has different names for the same thing. Here's an example. So this is radiographic anatomy. And that's a chest. That's what the radiographers will call that. And that's a pelvis. That's what the radiographers will call that. But if you read your school books, yeah, then you get a diagram like this, and they call that area the thorax. Yeah? And they call that little green bit there the pelvis. So we've got different observers call things that look different names and they have different regions. And we've got that principle across, yeah? Here's some more examples. So here's the stomach, yeah? And this is the duodenum. And we've got the colon here, drawn. Um, and the esophagus here, and here is a radiographic um, image, and this is the stomach, and then we've got the duodenum, the pylorus, small intestine. Looks quite similar, but not quite the same. Okay, here's dissection of the abdomen, showing kidneys, and showing the great vessels, 
Here's a radiographic image taken by a CT scanner showing the kidneys and some of the great vessels, but not all of them. What's missing in this image? I don't need to know the, the, the name of the, of the structure, but you see all this black space. It looks like it's empty and vacuous, doesn't it? It looks like there's nothing there. But of course, the whole person, you feel yourself, feel your abdomen. All the rest's gone, hasn't it? You know, this is just a lie. You know, this is, this is a human being who's fully, um, you know, breathing and living. And yet all we're seeing is what we choose to see. Yeah, and the rest has been removed. And that then gives you quite a false impression of what things are like. In reality, there's no space at all between the kidney and anything else. Yeah, there's fat, there's muscle, there's other organs pressed in and really close apart. And once you get that idea, you can understand how things spread, how diseases spread, how you can understand how a disease in one organ can affect another system entirely, because they're all so intimately closely packed together. You've got simple representations of human anatomy, which you're probably a bit used to, and you've got the sort of messy and dirty reality of a surgery here on the heart. So hopefully we're going to move during our 10 weeks from this to this, in terms of our understanding. So my second point, yeah, the reality is often too complex to learn, so most teaching presentations are oversimplifications. So whatever we say, even at university level, um, is likely to be an oversimplification. But that's okay. No one can learn everything. Specialists have specialist knowledge. So be very wary of being sort of like, oh, I know my anatomy. Because the reality is that when you go into any specialist area, they'll know way more than you. Yep. No matter how many marks you get on our assessments here at Teesside. And the body is like a fractal. It's impossible to know everything. It just keeps getting more and more detailed the closer and closer you look at anything. So accept now you're not going to know everything. Do not get overwhelmed by the thickness of the anatomy text. Do not start at page one and think, right, I've got 12 weeks to read all of this. Because that's not going to work. You're just going to get to page 12 and you're going to start crying. <laughs> Has that happened to some of you already? Yeah. So... <laughs> So don't do that. Just accept that, you know, you need to know the highlights. We'll be presenting the highlights. You'll know, no matter how little you feel you've achieved of sucking this huge gobstopper, you'll actually know far more by Christmas than you ever did. Okay. We said, I said, we, you know, remember when London was pulled out of that map and made larger and put over somewhere where it wasn't? Yep. Um, anatomy and physiology textbooks. Can I just make a... Um, <coughs> this, is a this is a diagram that comes out of an anatomy and physiology textbook. Um, and it's not anatomically correct. Okay? Um, there are two completely different things. Anatomy is about where things are, what things relate to, and what they're called. Physiology is how things work. Yeah, in this class we're very, very, we're not really bothered about how things work. Yeah, we're only interested in where things are and what they relate to and how big they are and, you know, because you are aiming at various parts of the body to take images of those parts of the body. That's what your job is. And therefore you need to know where things are and where they're related to. Um, you're also trying to avoid certain structures as well with the radiation. So you need a good knowledge. When you look at a person, you need to be able to see them, you know, in three dimensions and see all their organs. And that doesn't really, it doesn't matter how the Krebs cycle works. It doesn't matter how respiration in a cell works. Not really. It will matter later when we're thinking about disease progression. But I see that as a nice to know rather than an essential. Now, sometimes the structure of something doesn't become clear unless you know what it's for. So we do have to talk a little bit. So, for example, the heart, we'll talk about how it pumps blood because it helps to identify the atriums from the ventricles and the septums and the 
tricuspid from the bicuspid and all of those sorts of things. But we're only learning how it works so that you can actually understand what you're looking at. This is a map of um, England based on population. <coughs> Yeah, and it's totally distorted. So the idea is each ward is drawn to scale of its population. Yeah, and you can see London is enormous. Yeah, and totally distorted. You would, this map would be rubbish for getting around. You know, planning a trip from London to somewhere, you wouldn't be able to use this map, would you? Because it's only there to teach you one thing, give you an impression of one thing. Like this is only there to give you an impression of the idea that there's venous and arterial blood. Apart from that, it's useless. And the idea of naming things from that is vaguely ridiculous because you know you get the idea that these are really similar in size when they're not at all. You know, the cephalic vein is nothing like the size of the inferior vena cava. Here's another one of those maps this is talking about geology so this is mapping the country in terms of their geology useful map if you're interested in rocks if you want to look at fossils for example you can go to the jurassic coast down in um, the south coast and try and pick some fossils off the beach but you can see that line of rock goes all the way up here up here up here and comes out in the north york moor so you can go to saltburn instead and look at the fossils or whitby because it's the same rock laid down at the same time, it has the same fossils in it. Okay, point three, physiology and anatomy are different. Diagrams usually do not help your perception of where organs are, what they're related to and how big they are. Always be very wary of diagrams in books. Don't rely on an anatomy and physiology textbook. So do not buy an anatomy and physiology textbook with your hundred quid and think, great, I've got anatomy covered. You need a regional anatomy textbook without the physiology bit in it. Yep, so we've recommended two textbooks. They're very cheap. The reason we've recommended them is because they're accessible and they're relatively small. They're not terrifying. You can buy one of those enormous tomes, but they will terrify you. I'd rather that you had something that you thought, maybe it's achievable for me to flick through this between now and Christmas. Okay, so what am I looking at here? Yeah. The earth, yeah, but what, it's not the earth now, is it? When, what is it? The earth when? Yeah. <coughs> millions of years ago, yes. The earth millions of years ago. So this is, this, is a, this is the theory of plate tectonics, okay? The idea that the earth is made of moving plates of land um, and those plates are being disrupted and moved by the sort of processes under the earth, you know, volcanoes and things like that. And the idea is that um, eons ago, we had almost a single continent of land and we had water, and those continents then started to split up and move apart, okay? They used to call this Gondwanda land. Now, the parallel to us is that we started as an embryo okay so when we were an embryo we look different to what we do now and we have <coughs> changed but some for some reason anatomists um, decided to name things at this stage and then those names then start to get a little bit perverse once we've moved to our new shape okay so if you look at the fetus here for example you've got arm buds and leg buds okay and um, when they, we were at this stage a number of weeks old in the womb then our arm buds and our leg buds flexed and extended in the same direction yeah so our elbows went like that and our knees went like that as well Of course, during development, what happens is that the leg bud starts to rotate inwards. Yep, it starts to turn in and in and in and in and in around. And so now, as a human adult, my elbow flexes like that and my knee flexes like that. So we call that flexion and we also call that flexion. 
which is confusing, isn't it? But it's because of embryology. And a lot of names in anatomy are due to our embryological development. So, for example, the back of our back is called the dorsal aspect of our back. Like a shark's fin is the dorsal fin because it's on the back of the shark, yeah? So we have a dorsal aspect of our back. And we have a ventral surface, which is the front of us. Um, but the brain has a dorsal aspect, and it's not the back of the brain. It's the top of the brain, which is the dorsal aspect. And that's because in our embryology, we used to start off with what's called a notochord, yeah, which was a dead straight tube. And we called this the dorsal aspect, and we called this the ventral aspect. And then to develop the brain, the top of the notochord folded over. And then the brain formed from the top of the notochord. So they call this bit the dorsal bit, and this bit the ventral bit. So blame em embryology if uh, you're having a problem with some of the terminology. So we're going to be teaching you basic stuff. You're then going to think, well, obviously the back of the brain, brain must be the dorsal aspect, and it isn't. So point four, during human development, the body changes shape. Embryology can explain weird naming conventions and the roots of some structures. So you have the recurrent laryngeal nerve, for example, that starts here and goes down and underneath and back up. Why does it do that? Because it, the, the, as we grew, the neck expanded, and so the nerve had to develop this kink in it. Okay, reference points. Who's a map reader? Back to my geographic analogy. Does anyone like go hiking? A bit of orienteering, a bit of mountaineering? In the North York Moors or wherever you are? So here, name a feature on this map that you're familiar with. Yep. Gradient lines, yes. These brown lines here, these are contour lines, okay? And they're in metres, so that one's 100 metres, so that all of the things, all of the points on the map that are at 100 metres sea level are around that same contour line there. And then we've got 120 metres and 130 metres and 140 metres. So up here, this is a hill, yeah? Because it's, you'd have to climb up to go up against those gradients there. Now, if you just take these words, they don't... You've got lower bottom house farm and you've got upper bottom house farm. That seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Because lower bottom house farm is higher on the map than mm. upper bottom house farm is, which is lower on the map. But of course, when we look at where they are, lower bottom house farm is on that gradient line there, which is, I think, 80 metres. Upper bottom house farm is on this one here, which is 90 and... So it's about 10 or 15 metres climbing up the hill to get to up the bottom house farm. So it makes some sense when you look at the gradient lines, doesn't it? What are these blue lines? What do they indicate? Why is the map this way up? The grid, yeah. And so what's, what's the top of the map indicate? North, yeah. And what's the bottom? South. Over here? East. Yep, so we've laid out a grid of our own devising. It was man that did that. Animals didn't do that. Yeah. In fact, where's the original zero, zero north-south line? Changes year by year. Changes, so it's... No, not really. <laughs> Magnetic north may change, but that's not the point I'm trying to get at. Where's the original zero, zero north-south line? Through the middle of what? No, the equator is an east-west line. Yeah. Oh. The north-south meridian is where? It's Greenwich, London, England. Yeah? Because it was us that said that's a zero line and we're going to call everything that way east and everything that way west. It's why we are right in the middle of every map. You know the world maps... It's us, isn't it? We're in the middle. It's one of the things that's wrong with this country. <laughs> because we think we're so politically important, because we're the centre of the world on every map. Don't worry, the Americans changed that on their maps. 
They don't really. They don't. They move it off a little bit, but not really. What's really interesting is where you see maps that are written, drawn politically for another reason. So if you look at the Australian, they have a they have a joke map they don't that they use, which of course is the upside down, and Australia's in the middle. And it's really interesting because England is then about as important as Vietnam is on our map. It's a tiny little thing in the top left hand corner or something, uh, or the bottom left hand corner. And I think if we had a map like that, we'd realise that we are actually not necessarily as significant as we think we are. Yeah? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> so what the point is, this is a man-made structure. And there's Greenwich there, you see, and that's zero, zero. Yeah? Um, so we, uh, coincidentally, Middlesbrough is pretty much on the zero line as well. So we're on that meridian there, pretty much. We're about 54 degrees north or something. We're so many degrees north but we're virtually no degrees east or west. We're pretty much bang on the meridian. Yeah? So these are lines of longitude, the ones that go north-south, and we've got lines of latitude that go east-west, and the equator is the famous zero line of latitude. Yeah? So that's a man-made structure so that we can navigate around the globe. And it's useful in maps, and it's useful to tell people something. So we need the same for the human body. Man-made, they're not things you could see when you look at the political, they're lines that we decide, okay? Um, now, the thing about the world is it's a globe. It doesn't have appendages, it doesn't have arms and legs and, and a head. So the first thing to make any sort of structure that allows us to navigate on the, the body, we have to do something that we don't have to do with the globe, which is we have to say which position the person's in before we draw our lines. Yeah, you happy with that? So we call it the anatomical position. Who's heard of that? Few people, yeah. So the anatomical position, so the idea is it's facing forwards, feet slightly apart, hands by your side with your palms forward. Okay? And there's stuff about your male genitalia as well, but we'll just ignore that. So, which is why that's not an accurate diagram. So... Okay, so, once we've got our anatomical position, then we can draw these political lines, and we can start to make conversations. So with our blue lines on our map, we can talk about something being north of something else, or south of something else, or east of something else, or west of something else, because we've established the lines. So now, once we've got our lines, we can talk about, we can use our own anatomical terminology to describe where things are. And this is what the whole of today is going to be about, okay, in terms of anatomy. So we have three instead of two sets of lines. We have lines that cut the body from, um, well, this is where I would quite like to have a volunteer. Who, might, who doesn't mind standing at the front and me pointing at them? Come on then. <laughs> Thanks very much. So if you stand here in the anatomical position, okay, so <laughs> facing forward, hands, palms facing forward, feet slightly apart, so that's perfect. Good. So, first, <laughs> forget him. So the first, first set of lines, right, are going to split our, our person down from head to foot, and they're going to have, create a right half and a left half, okay? And that's called a sagittal line, or a sagittal plane. And we've got more than one of them. You know, we've got more than one of any of these lines, like we had on the globe. You know, you've got the zero meridian in Greenwich, but then you've got all many, you've got hundreds of others, you can just draw them. As long as they're <coughs> parallel to the meridian, they're another line of longitude. So in our case, we've got the median sagittal plane, which goes straight down the middle. And then we've got any number of sagittal planes we can draw left or right. Okay? Happy with that? Yeah. And anything that's closer to the middle is called medial. Anything further away from the middle is called lateral. So we've now, instead of north-south or east-west, so in this case it's like east-west, so if I move from this point here to over here, then I'm going laterally. And if I go from this point here to this point here, I'm going laterally. Yeah? yeah. So it's like east and west. 
You happy with that? So the sagittal plane gives us medial and lateral as direction indicators. So next we have to draw the, we can draw a line down the side of our patient or our subject and we've got a front and a back. Yeah, and that's coronal plane. Well done. So that's the coronal plane. And again, we can have any number of coronals, but the one that is one called the mid axillary line, which is sort of the zero for coronal, so which goes through the axilla of the armpit. It's the mid axillary line. Now, we have describing words for that. So any plane that goes forward from the mid axillary line is called anterior. And anything posterior, anything from the mid axillary line back is posterior. Yeah? So we can move anteriorly or we can move posteriorly on the body. So the coronal plane gives us these describing words anterior and posterior, like we have north and south for latitude. Then we have an extra one, because the, the globe doesn't have that, and that cuts the body into an upper and a lower portion, okay? And that's the axial plane. Now remember that when you're a different observer, then you have different names for things. So if I'm a uh, radiographer, I'm going to call that the axial plane. But if I am a physio physiotherapist, I'm going to call it the horizontal plane or the transverse plane. So they're all the same thing. And we've got terminology then. We have cranial towards the head or caudal towards the feet on the axial plane. So that gives us the describing words cranial and caudal. Okay, thank you very much. See. So just like north, south, east, west, we have our describing words to describe our way around the body. But it all relates to the anatomical position. We have a couple of extras. Okay, um, The limbs, just the limbs, and only the limbs, have two extras. Because you can talk about how something's close to the trunk or far away from the trunk. This is being the trunk. So close to the trunk is proximal and far away from the trunk is distal and that works just in the legs and just in the arms or just in the lower limb and just in the upper limb that's a bit extra dorsal and ventral again radiographers don't tend to use dorsal and ventral vets tend to use dorsal and ventral and anatomists tend to use dorsal and ventral so we'd use posterior and anterior Okay, surface marking. So, the other thing that you need when you want to work around the body is you need some landmarks, don't you? If I was to ask you to describe your journey to the university today, then think about it just for a second, because we haven't got long. I bet you start thinking about, well, I'd turn right at the end of my road and I'd walk down to the traffic lights, yeah? And I would take a left and then I'd go to the roundabout and then I would carry on left until I got to that big church. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm using landmarks, things that I see along the way to identify my directions. Things that we use are pubs, churches, traffic lights, roundabouts. Well, in the human body, we have all these landmarks. And these are the things you must learn. These are the really quick wins. And we're going to be identifying these throughout the practicals. Yeah, so the jugular notch, that's a really important landmark that you can see quite easily on most people. It's a bony point, so it doesn't move. You don't want a bus to be a landmark, do you? I turn left at the red bus, because tomorrow the red bus won't be there, will it? It will have moved. You need things that are going to stay put. So landmarks tend to be bony, because they don't move, you know? Whereas, you know, as we get older, or as we eat more pies, then our soft tissue landmarks, like our belly button, for example, it's not a very good landmark. Yeah, because it tends to move about. <laughs> it tends to be in different places and different people. So just like on our map, we have all these landmarks, we have these landmarks on the human body. And we can use them to form, we can use the terms we've just described and the landmarks to describe journeys and routes. So here's a description of a route of the radial nerve, okay? So let's just read it quickly. It arises from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Okay, so we're relating it to something else, the brachial plexus, and we know it comes out the back yeah. of the brachial plexus because posterior means back. 
It's in the axilla. It lies posterior to the axillary artery and anterior to the subscapularis teres major and latissimus dorsi muscles. It leaves the axilla and travels postero inferiorly. Oh, now we're adding two things. Postero means going back, and inferior means going down towards the feet. I also we could say we could say caudally. So superior and inferior is the same as cranial and caudal. Different term, but same thing. And laterally, so three different directions it goes. It goes back, it goes down, and it goes to the side. Between the long and medial heads of triceps and enters the radial groove on the humerus. Anteriorly, it enters a muscular groove between brachioradialis and brachialis. It enters the forearm lateral to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So... If you were to get the elbow in your practical oral in December, then you get a mark for describing the root of an anatomical structure. Like that. You can do it. <laughs> Sorry? You're going to get given two parts four weeks before. You, and then one of those parts will be picked at random and you'll do that particular um, joint. So, if you can describe how you get to university by using landmarks and, you know, east, west, north, south, left, right, then you can do this. It's just a different set of language that means the same thing and we're talking about the human body rather than your route to work. Yeah? It's not conceptually difficult. We're going to immerse you in anatomy on Fridays. You just should think and breathe anatomy all the minutes of the day on a Friday. And then by then, you'll be fine. It's like learning any language. You have to be immersed in it, and you have to keep using it. If you don't use it, then you won't learn it. You can watch as many YouTube videos as you like about how to learn French, but you won't learn any French unless you speak it. Yeah, same with anatomy. So point five, the anatomical position is the default. Everything relates to this. Planes and surface markings are our reference system for navigating the human body. Describing movement. So this is a goniometer. Okay? And we can use this to measure the movement that people make in various planes away from the anatomical position. The anatomical position is zero. Any movement away from the anatomical position is measured using one of these in a particular plane. Which plane is this person moving in? Nope. Coronal. coronal. They're moving in the coronal plane. There's a coronal plane that comes out of the person, yeah, that moves in that direction. So the, every movement that way is in the coronal plane. Is that a movement, movement called duction? The body? Yes, so that's abduction, yeah, because it moves away from the body. So if you imagine where her leg would be in the anatomical position and we do that, then we've got a certain degrees of movement in the coronal plane. Get it? So her leg has moved about 45 degrees in the coronal plane, yeah? And her arm, which should be down here, has moved 120 degrees in the coronal plane. That's easy, isn't it? Movements are named according to the planes they occur in. Okay. In reality, most are coordinated compound movements involving many muscles and several joints. So we make it simple. Yeah? When I do that, I'm not just moving one muscle and one group. It's very complicated, but we're just going to make it simple. This is first year anatomy. It needs to be simple, doesn't it? Otherwise, we'll just think that it's undoable and we'll just give up right from day one. Anatomical names. So, this is the biceps muscle. Yep. Look at that. Look at the guns on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Biceps means two heads. We're going to be learning a bit of Greek and a bit of Latin. Yeah, biceps is Greek for two-headed. Yeah. And you can see that those heads are 
attached. That one's attached to the coracoid process of the scapula, and this one's attached to the superior tubercle of the glenoid of the scapula. <laughs> okay. Now, you know that as the biceps. The problem is that down at the leg here, down here, on the lateral aspect of the thigh, what you might call part of a hamstring, yeah, that's also the biceps because it's got two heads, yeah? And so we call that biceps femoris because it's near the femur. And we call this biceps brachii because it's in the brachium. Some things have two names, or t one th they'll have two, one name for two different things in the body. Here we have another example. So this is the coronoid process of the ulna in the forearm, and this is the coronoid process of the mandible, the jaw, just here. They just reused the words because the words are descriptive, and they mean, in this case, um, beak-like. So that's beak-like, isn't it? Well, that's beak-like as well, so we'll call that beak-like as well. There's a fight between the Greek and the Latin. So, the Greek derivation of this nerve is the perineal nerve, okay? So some textbooks will call this the common perineal nerve there. But the Latin for this area is fibula. So the, some textbooks will call this the fibula nerve, common fibula nerve. It's the same thing. It's got two names. Where we identify these things will tell you. And this is the reason why I do really rubbish at pub quizzes. You know, I'm in a pub quiz team and, and there's a sort of anatomy question. And they all look at me and go, oh, great, Phil, you're on our team. And my heart sinks because I know I'm going to get the answer wrong because they'll ask, how many bones are there in the human body? And I'll go, well, it depends. <laughs> it's either 200, 203, 206, I don't know. So we go with whatever and always get it wrong. And there's some pub quiz person who says, no, the answer is 203. <sighs> so you'll end up with that in a quiz. You'll do some quiz online and you'll say, that's the fibula nerve. And they'll say, wrong, it's the perineal nerve. Notice, by the way, the bone is the fibula with an A and the nerve is the fibula with an AR. Point seven, many objects have two names, and some names have two objects. So thank you.